Welcome to worship. O oh God, we trust in your power to create, to sustain, to enable. But we could not trust if we did not know that you are always near. Be with us, Lord, as we are gathered here to worship you. Help us not to check our minds or our hearts at the door, but enable us to bring all that we are to you, so that we might experience your touch upon all aspects of our life. We pray this because of and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate, lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. 
in Hades where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends the reading. Today, we heard the famous story of the rich man who is not given a name and the poor man Lazarus who lives at his gate and should not be confused with Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. The rich man, according to the parable, lives a life of luxury and ease. In contrast, Lazarus, a poor man, lives at the gate outside the rich man's home. The rich man doesn't seem to care about the plight of Lazarus. He doesn't even care enough to give Lazarus his leftovers. He is utterly indifferent to Lazarus's problems. In time, both men die. First Lazarus, the sickly poor man, then eventually the well-fed rich man. In the afterlife, their positions are reversed. The rich man is tormented, and Lazarus is having an experience of eternal bliss. But the rich man does not just accept his fate. He begs Abraham to have Lazarus, someone he previously would not even give the time of day, to relieve his suffering. But Abraham tells him the window of opportunity for his repentance has closed. Then the man begs Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers to repent so that they don't have to suffer his fate. For once, the rich man is showing that he is able to care about someone besides himself. Abraham points out that the message that he should not be so selfish and greedy is amply covered by the prophets. In a foreshadowing of his own fate, Jesus concludes the story by having Abraham tell the rich man that someone raised from the dead is not going to make a difference to the rich man's brothers if they have ignored the teachings of the prophets. What message are we supposed to take from this parable? To fully understand this parable, we need to put it into the context of the whole gospel according to Luke. Each gospel in the New Testament focuses on a unique view of the ministry and message of Jesus. Luke's gospel focuses on Jesus' love and care for the poor and oppressed that reflect God's love and care for them. In some stories in Luke, Jesus tells rich people that they need to give a significant amount of their wealth to the poor. But Jesus does not seem to have a problem with all rich people. In the story that we heard last week, a rich father who is compassionate toward his wayward son is the hero of the story. So the problem does not seem to be wealth. Through this story, Jesus seems to be indicating that the real sin is exhibiting indifference toward the suffering of others, especially those who are not part of your own family or your own circle. This is something that pertains to all of us as Christians. Who must we care for? 
How much must we care in order to consider ourselves faithful in the eyes of Jesus? Every day, I see people justify a lack of compassion for others for what they see as careless or self-destructive behavior. It is hard for us to understand why other people make bad decisions, but that does not mean that we have a right to condemn them. In the eyes of God, all are worthy of compassion and redemption. Some of us are more finely attuned to this need for compassion than others. I remember when our children who are adopted first joined our family in Russia, how their hearts went out to older people we saw begging in the streets in Moscow. Apparently, the pension system in Russia was underfunded, so the country had developed a problem with poverty and homelessness, particularly among the elderly. So we began carrying around loose change to hand out to these older folks when we saw them begging. Though my children never experienced homelessness, they have experienced poverty firsthand, so they naturally have compassion for those who suffer the many negative effects that come from poverty. Compassion is actually a natural human impulse. Even young children exhibit compassion. We tend to think of children as being greedy and selfish, but that is certainly not the whole picture. Nurturing the natural compassion in young people is one of the important tasks of Christian education. As we age, it is possible for us to become less compassionate. Why is that? Well, most of us come to understand that scams and ripoffs are everywhere and that if we are not careful, we can easily get ripped off and lose everything so that we also become like the poor people we see. And that would not help anyone. I would venture a guess that you have probably been the recipient of a number of phone and email scam attempts just within the past week. And that tends to make us all a bit cynical. There is much suffering in the world. Hearing about it can feel overwhelming at times. In order to deal with the huge amount of suffering in our world, people have a tendency to try and compare suffering in order to minimize the suffering of some in comparison to the suffering of others. If they minimize it, then they feel like they don't have to care about it. And that is a relief to not have to care so much about so many. In the eyes of God, all suffering is worthy of compassion. You don't need to solve everyone's problems, but you should feel compassion for suffering. Compassion for the suffering of others is not optional for Christians, according to Scripture. So, how do we act on our compassion? It begins with listening. To nurture Christian compassion, we need to resist clinging to our snap judgments of people and their situations. Unfortunately, we live in a world that encourages us to make and stick to our snap judgments. Have you ever changed your feelings about another person or about something over time? I'm guessing that you have. Most of us have. It's because our snap judgments are often limited. We often don't get all of the pertinent information in a matter of seconds or when we first hear about or see something. Tabloid-style journalism in print, on TV, and on the internet is designed to create and maintain snap judgments. In reality, the situations covered almost always deserve a deeper examination of more aspects of the issue. It can be tempting to define the world in black and white terms, but the real wisdom is to be found in the gray areas. Which brings us to the hot topic of today, cancel culture. The original meaning of canceling is to boycott or withdraw support of a public figure 
usually in response to bad behavior by the person. It is controversial because usually the work in question is beloved. One of the main arguments in favor of doing this is as a way of giving consequences to a person who has not received consequences or perhaps what is deemed not enough consequences through the legal system for whatever reason. Based on this logic, it doesn't really make sense to cancel the works of people who have died, but some people argue for this, although generally with an attitude that it is less of a moral imperative than an understandable individual choice. Sadly now, this idea of cancel culture has been stretched to the point that it doesn't really have much meaning anymore. Cancel culture has turned into the latest expression used to manufacture outrage in order to drive ratings, sales, political, and charitable donations. There are points to be made on both sides of controversial individuals and issues. But society would benefit from all of us trying to bring more light and less heat to these discussions. Now, is the point of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man that God has canceled the rich man in the afterlife? Because that is clearly what has happened. In the parable, the rich man receives permanent, drastic consequences for behavior that really doesn't seem clearly and obviously worthy of such consequences by our modern standards of law and morals anyways. I think Jesus's main reason for telling this story is to drive the audience, which includes those who feel perfectly fine with themselves morally, to drive them to a deeper self-examination. Nothing will make us so charitable and tender to the faults of others as by self-examination thoroughly to know our own. Which brings us to the subject of the annual day of kindness, which represents something concrete that we can do to respond to this scripture I am suggesting that each of you, either as part of a larger group or as an individual, that each of you plan and carry out an act of kindness for someone that is different in some way from the usual beneficiaries of your kindness and your charity. Now let me make this clear. I'm not asking you to support an issue with which you disagree. I am asking you instead to look beyond stereotypes, to move beyond your comfort zone as you reach out with compassion to an individual or individuals in need. If it is at all possible, try to make a personal connection when you do this. If you don't have money to spare or you aren't really able to leave your house much, you could write a note or make a phone call. Even a very nice email or Facebook message can be deeply appreciated. If you're looking for an example of reaching out to help someone beyond your comfort zone, Patton Oswalt gives a good example. After he posted an anti-Trump poem on social media, fans of the then president, including a man named Michael Beatty, posted some negative things in response. Oswald went back and forth with the man, and then something, for some reason, made Oswald, who was a wealthy man, look closer at Michael Beatty's social media. And then he learned that Beatty had a lot of health issues and medical bills, not unlike poor Lazarus. So, Patton Oswald donated to Beatty's GoFundMe and posted on social media encouraging others to do the same. Within a short time, donations to the GoFundMe had surpassed the $5,000 goal by more than $26,000. Michael Beatty responded, I want to thank everyone who came to my aid with generous outpourings and also to Patton Oswalt, without whom I would not be the recipient of so much love and support. I'm not a man who ever cries, but I had to wait to send this. In addition to feeling grateful, Beatty also had a bit of a change of heart. Oswald 
he said, managed to not only let me slide on a rough tweet to him, but started something that he has me reevaluating friendships and productive dialogue, regardless of political affiliation. Patton, you have humbled me to the point where I can barely compose my words. You have caused me to take pause and reflect on how harmful words from my mouth could result in such an outpouring. As I conclude today, I'd like to remind everyone that kindness matters and no act of kindness is ever wasted. May we all notice people in need of kindness and compassion and reach out to them with ours. Amen. And now we begin our time of prayer with a time of silent prayer, contemplation, and praying for one another. Compassionate God, we ask your compassion on each one of us. Teach us your compassion. Teach us to see as you see and to reach out to those that you would have us reach out to. Remind us that you depend upon us to spread your kingdom in this world. We ask your blessing and your healing upon all who need it. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. And now with the confidence that comes from knowing that we are children of God, let us join in the prayer our Savior taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I cannot see, I Let us rejoice. God so loves the world. May God, your maker, send you back into the world with creative energies refreshed. May Christ the light illuminate your fearful moments. And may the Holy Spirit of steadfast love guide you until we worship together again. This day and forevermore. Amen.